Well, welcome everyone to our fall literary lecture series hosted by the Antrim Literature Project, an online public humanities platform that aims to make the study of literature accessible to readers beyond the paywalls of the university. We're happy to offer this series of free introductory lectures on a variety of literary topics this fall, and you can find all of the recorded lectures on our database at antrimliteratureproject.org. And we have the pleasure of hearing tonight Joshua Raleigh, a PhD candidate in English literature at Indiana University Bloomington. He received his BA in history from Gordon College and his Masters of Science by Research in Victorian literature from the University of Edinburgh. His research focuses on the roles that literary form, religious context, and the past play in shaping British literature throughout the long 19th century. Recent publications of his on these topics have appeared in the Journal of Scottish Thought and in the forthcoming Through the Looking Glass, a companion. His doctoral dissertation focuses on prophecy as a mode of address in the long 19th century, demonstrating how prophecy shaped a variety of literary genres, including poetry, realism, and fantasy. Joshua's lecture is titled Grieving with Tennyson. Thank you, Joshua, for being here. Yeah, thank you, um, Adam, and everyone else at Antrim. I'm gonna just take a second here to you know, do the classic thing of figuring out sharing my screen. Okay, can everybody see my slides? Just want to make sure. All right, wonderful. Um, so again, just thank you all for coming out tonight. And again, thank you to Adam and everyone at Antrim for um, this whole lecture series, which has been fantastic so far. And I'm uh, very excited to be doing the penultimate one um, for the series. Um, but I'll just launch right into my talk then. So when Prince Albert died in 1861, Queen Victoria told Alfred Tennyson, who was then poet laureate, but not yet Alfred Lord Tennyson, that next to the Bible, in memoriam was my comfort, is what she said. Despite the fact that we call it the Victorian age, it is actually quite rare that the eponymous queen, Queen Victoria, so well encapsulates a part of English society in the 19th century. However, in this case, Victoria's comment is representative of many of Victorians' sentiment. Of all the voluminous poet poems written in the 19th century, for the Victorians, In Memoriam, a poem 11 years old at the time that Victoria spoke those words to, to Tennyson, was simply the poem. <clears throat> but why? And perhaps more importantly for this audience, not comprised of dusty old Victorian scholars like myself, why bring up this poem? And why care about what the Victorians thought of it? And why does this poem continue to matter? And really, there is something fair here. On the one hand, this poem is perhaps an unlikely candidate for holding such a prestigious position. It's long. It's about 2,916 lines long, um, divided into 133 cantos or small poem sort of sections of it, which we'll get into in a second. It's winding, seemingly personal, since the poem's full title is In Memoriam A-H-H, referring to a specific person being memorialized. And so in answer to the question of why does this matter, I might point us to the above quote by Victoria, or to dozens like it from characters both high and low from the Victorian period and up until today. Or I might direct us to lines we all can recognize from the poem. Perhaps you've heard the line, uh, nature read in tooth and claw. And I can guarantee that we're almost all familiar with the line, tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all, which comes from this poem. But really all of those responses that I could give at best push off truly grappling with a poem that is beautiful, frustrating, haunting, terrifying, intimate, and convicting. At worst, these responses that I've already given threaten to neutralize the power of the poem. My talk then tonight hopes to push us to a deeper understanding of In Memoriam, one that is by no means revolutionary or comprehensive, but is that is nonetheless contains an argument for how we can better understand it. For if In Memoriam really was the poem of the Victorian period, then the danger 
lingers, that it will swiftly be relegated to a heap of passé literature, its famous lines becoming nothing more than cliché, and its compelling passages dismissed as sentimental dross, characteristic of that famously saccharine period, the Victorian age. My task then tonight is twofold. First and foremost, to introduce newcomers to the poem, and second, to reintroduce it um, to even those of you who maybe are long familiar with it and already love it. I can't be comprehensive, as I said, see my previous comment about the length of it, but my hope is that after tonight, a few of you might feel inspired and equipped to read the poem yourselves for the first or for the 50th time and consider what it might have to offer you. Before getting into the poem itself, though, I want to introduce you to Tennyson himself and to the relationship at the poem's core between him and Arthur Henry Hallam, the A-H-H of the poem's title. Tennyson was born in 1809 and, despite coming from a family of 12 children, described his childhood as dark and isolating. His father was an Anglican priest and scholar in Lincolnshire, but struggled with alcoholism and other mental health issues, conditions that he passed on to some of Tennyson's siblings. Tennyson described his family as filled with, quote, black blood, making them abusive, angry, and violent. All of this contributed to Tennyson's real sense of loneliness and anxiety throughout his life. However, this all began to change when, Ten when Tennyson went to Cambridge University at age 18 in 1828. Really, the only way to describe this experience for Tennyson is liberating. Cambridge was everything that Lincolnshire was not, vivacious, energetic, full of life. Tennyson was able to cultivate his poetry, which he had always written, but which at Cambridge took on new dimensions as he moved from, po from poetry as something he wrote in relative isolation to something that he engaged as part of his social life. Tennyson joined the famous Cambridge Apostles, a student group, um, and a semi-secret society centered around Tennyson's Trinity College and dedicated to debate and philosophy. In Tennyson's time, though, the apostles really centered around this figure of Arthur Hallam, who was actually two years younger than Tennyson, but who had already been at Cambridge for two years when Tennyson arrived. Hallam was one of those polymaths of this period that's almost ubiquitous in the 19th century. Um, all of his contemporaries just spoke of his philosophical brilliance, his attractive charisma, the sort of like energy that was behind him in the sense that Hallam would be the person of the 19th century. His import, in fact, should be evident in the fact that his closest friend, aside from Tennyson, was the future Prime Minister William Gladstone, who he had known at Eton and who would go on to be one of the greatest politicians of the 19th century and paved the way for a lot of modern Britain today. The relationship between Hallam and Tennyson, though, was mutually beneficial, with Hallam gravitating towards Tennyson as a poet whom he viewed on par with some of the most um, important uh, uh, poets of the previous generation, like Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Percy Shelley. And the naturally shy Tennyson was attracted to Hallam's uh, charisma, his charismaticness, the way he was able to build this community around him. However, Tennyson's happy time in Cambridge came to a sudden end in 1831 when his father died. Tennyson left the university without completing his degree in order to help look after his family, especially his younger sisters who remained at home. His friendship, though, remained strong with Hallam, though, and Hallam came to visit that summer. During the visit, Hallam fell in love with Tennyson's sister, Emily, and they became engaged. The coming marriage between Emily and Hallam delighted Tennyson and seemed that it would only cement that brotherly intimacy that Tennyson was already feeling with him. However, the greater blow came a few years later um, in this period, on September 15th, 1833, when Hallam died. He and his father had been traveling through Europe and were staying in Vienna. Hallam had been ill with a fever and chill, but was beginning to feel better. Um, so he and his father decided that they'd go out for a walk around the streets and around along the river in Vienna. Um, and then Hallam sat, uh, once they got back from that walk, Hallam sat by a fire in their rooms, decided he would relax with some wine, read, while his father went out for another short walk. But when his father returned an hour or so later, Hallam was in the same position that his father had left him. He had died of a sudden stroke or a brain aneurysm. We can't quite be sure at age 22. So very young, very sudden. Tennyson found out about this two weeks later by letter, a letter sent by Hallam's uncle, and had to give the news to his sister, Emily, the one who's engaged to Hallam. Um, and 
it's very haunting reading the sort of like recollections of those period of that period for Tennyson sort of having this moment of having to tell his sister of the death of her fiance, who is also his closest friend. So it's hard to overstate the impact of Helen's sudden death that it had on Tennyson, um, as well as many in their generation, um, with one friend writing that uh, Hallam's death was, quote, a loud and terrible stroke from the reality of things upon the fairy building of our youth, end quote. Again, like, think about the idealism here, that these were a bunch of young, you know, fresh out of college or in college students who all, like, felt that this guy was going to be their leader, and then suddenly he's dead, and this shocks all of them. And Gladstone even recounts wandering in the meadows of Oxford weeping and when he received the news of Hallam's death. However, because of the importance of <clears throat> uh, Hallam on moving Tennyson out of this darkness of his childhood, the shock of the death impacted him particularly greatly. Um, indeed, aside from In Memoriam, Tennyson wrote some of his other most famous poems in the aftermath of Hallam's death, including Ulysses, um, with its famous final lines, one equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive to seek to find and not to yield. And Morty Arthur, again, sort of note the name there, King Arthur, Arthur Hallam. Um, the old order changeth, yielding place to new, and God fulfills himself in many ways, lest one good custom should corrupt the world. In memoriam, however, would be the work that came to represent Tennyson's years-long wrestling with Hallam's death. Indeed, the poem is not really one poem at all, but a series of shorter poems, all written in the same verse structure, again, more on that in a second, composed between 1833 and 1850. As Tennyson would go on to describe it, um, the sections were written mainly at many different places, and as the phrases of intercourse came to my memory and suggested them, I did not write them with any view of weaving them into a whole or for publication until I found that I had written so many. The, poems at, the poem as we have it today then was not written in some sort of sudden flurry after Hallam's death, but reflects a sustained meditation on grief that would not be published until 17 years after Hallam was buried. Now, I've spent a good long time on this biographical component of Tennyson and Hallam's friendship, and I've done this first because it is interesting to me, um, and second because I do think that it bears on the poem. There are moments where Tennyson recreates a memory of his time with Hallam, such as when he returns to Cambridge in uh, Canto 87, which I have up here on the slide. Um, but I should also mention that it would be wrong to read this poem as biography, as an actual biography or journal. Tennyson said over and over again that, quote, this is not, this is a poem, not an actual biography. It was founded on our friendship, on the engagement of Arthur Hallam to my sister, on his sudden death at Vienna just before the time fixed for their marriage, and on his burial at Clevedon Church. The poem concludes with the marriage of my youngest sister, Cecilia. It was meant to be a kind of Divina Commedia ending in happiness. <clears throat> the poem then is based on biography and these events and the reality of the characters and minds that appear in the poem give it a sense of intimacy and reality, but is ultimately a poem that goes well beyond what Tennyson felt at any particular moment. In reading this poem a bit with you tonight, then, I want to highlight a few central themes, read a few of the most striking passages, as well as offer a few thoughts on what the poem does for us, its readers and listeners. Um, one of the most powerful elements of the poem's history, in fact, is how it was both privately read and publicly recited throughout the 19th century. So I think it invites us into just the type of textual engagement that the Interim Literature Project is all about. A few notes then before we dive into the text on the form of the poem. At its most basic, In Memoriam is an elegy, meaning that it is a poem of personal but public-facing lament. The poem is really a series of 133 poems, as I said, that Tennyson calls and breaks down into cantos, written between 1833 and 1850, again, as I've said. And the order in which we read the poems is not indicative of the order in which they were written. One of the constant senses that one gets in reading the poem as a whole is a mingled sense of order and fragmentation, of sort of breaking apart, with each poem working on its own, but also contributing to a whole, but also pushing back against that whole. 
The more one reads it, the more one experiences both this fragmentation that results into a unity of diverse experiences and feelings. The fluctuating of division and unification mirrors Tennyson's experience. He himself feels torn in two by the death of his other half, Hallam. The whole poem stretches the heart toward a hope of reunification that can only happen if Tennyson himself is able to join Hallam in the afterlife. This duality is most visibly most visibly formed, though, in the stanza stru structure, through the stanza structure, which remains constant through all of the poem, and which defies the typical conventions of an elegy. In the century before Tennyson, elegy elegies tended to be written in iambic pentameter. Um, you know, iambic pentameter, if you've had an English class in high school, probably the verse sort of structure meter that you're most familiar with of five feet or segments of syllables that go unstressed and then stressed, the sort of like da-dum uh, pattern that um, is stately in English. It creates this um, sense of completion in an English line. Think of something like, shall I compare thee to a summer's day that just sort of naturally flows off the tongue. And in elegies, this was often compared with a rhyming scheme of A, B, A, B. Um, and the regularity of that rhyming scheme with the iambic pentameter created a feeling of regularity and return, this sort of like moving progress through the course of a poem. In memoriam, though, is written in iambic tetrameter, not pentameter, meaning that it keeps that feeling of the unstressed and stressed, the da-dum, um, but it only does that four times, not five. And so there's always the sense of something lacking, of something that's waiting at the end of a line, um, of further waiting for completion or something like that. The result is, again, that each of these lines feels incomplete, forcing Tennyson to stretch the grammar of sentences from one line to the next, a process called enjambment, so sort of like continuing a sentence one line through to the next line. And moreover, Tennyson uses this funny rhyme scheme of ABBA rather than ABAB that is completely unheard of before him in the tradition of writing elegies. And so while this still contains that two pairs of rhyming words, and I mean, it's both an A and a B, it feels kind of uneven, despite there's that um, a little bit of parallel there. But you lose that first word in the rhyme scheme, only to later return to it. So it has this strange sort of feeling that is created in it. And so to show what I mean, I've had up on the slide here, um, a look at In Memoriam in comparison to a more traditional elegy like Percy Shelley's Adonais. Um, and so you can see here, I've labeled a bit of that sort of um, scanning of the, the line, this process of unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, I weep for Adonais, he is dead, um, compared to strong son of God, immortal love, that sort of like opening up of that line there. And I've also labeled the rhyme scheme um, that changes a little bit um, in Shelley. He has a longer stanza structure, but these are the four, first four lines of both of these. So I'll read these um, to us and then I'll sort of break down how I'm viewing these a little bit. So from Shelley's Adonais, I weep for Adonais, he is dead. O weep for Adonais, though our tears fall not the frost which binds so dear a head, and, that, and thou sad hour selected from all years. Compare that to Tennyson. Strong son of God, immortal love, whom we that have not seen thy face, by faith and faith alone embrace, believing where we cannot prove. So you can already see some of the way that the sound works with this. With Tennyson, it almost forces you to continue moving forward. There's not as much punctuation um, ceasing at the end of a line. And each sentence almost like kind of bridges into the next line. So in Shelley, the grief, uh, in Shelley's poem, the grief turns immediately to public performance and the forward momentum of the rhythm is carrying us through these forward lines. However, in In Memoriam, there is a constant recursiveness that seems to make Tennyson and the reader cling and almost cling to the grief. Moreover, in Shelley, we are told from line one that the point of the poem is public elegizing. But in Tennyson, the poem begins by addressing Christ of all people, not Hallam, not a public, but of sort of referring to God and sort of throwing down this challenge of faith. Hallam actually won't even be mentioned and not even by name um, at this point for about 37 more lines in this poem. And he's only mentioned by name um, in Canto 9, so very far down in the poem. So through the very structure of the poem, then Tennyson is working to unmoor us from our expectations of what an elegy is supposed to be. 
Most elegies begin in grief and, and in, end in some sort of resolution, but in memoriam is different. In it, Tennyson is constantly fluctuating between grief and acceptance, despair and joy. The stanzas themselves are a reflection of this as they begin by ending with one sound, but then move on to a more concrete couplet before bouncing the reader back to the original sound. Love, face, embrace, prove. That sort of A, B, B, A structure again. The original rhyming sound is lost only to be regained by the end of the stanza. The sense is a sort of bounded loss and regain that requires a returning and dwelling on the past in order to move forward. So I'm going to read the first few first two cantos, and again, the cantos are the sections of these poems, to give you a sense of how this works and how Tennyson layers in the themes of the poem alongside this poetic structure. As I read, I want you to pay attention to the rhythm and the rhyme, noting again the way that Tennyson raises questions at the beginning of the stanzas and delays answering them until the end, and then frequently turns back against that answer that he's tentatively arrived at. Notice also how he uses this enjambment feature, finishing the metrical pattern of the line without finishing the sentence itself as a way to create both a sense of brokenness and continuity. <clears throat> so I'll read both of these to us. I held it truth with him who sings to one clear harp in diverse tones, that man may rise on stepping stones of their dead selves to higher things. But who shall so forecast the years and find in loss a gain to match, or reach a hand through time to catch the far off interest of tears? Let love clasp grief lest both be drowned, let darkness keep her raven gloss. Ah, sweeter to be drunk with loss, to dance with death, to beat the ground than that the victor hours should scorn the long result of love and boast. Behold the man that loved and lost, but all he was is overworn. Canto two. Old you which graspest at the stones that name the underlying dead, thy fibers net the dreamless head, thy roots are wrapped about the bones. The seasons bring the flower again and bring the firstling to the flock, and in the dusk of thee the clock beats out the little lives of men. O oh, not for thee the glow, the bloom, who changest not in any gale, nor branding summer suns avail to touch thy thousand years of gloom. And gazing on thee, sullen tree, sick for thy stubborn hardihood, I seem to fail from out my blood and grow incorporate into thee. So in the first stanza, Tennyson points to the certainty that he once held, that death is a gateway to fuller life. However, note how even in the revelation of that belief, <clears throat> excuse me, that revelation of that belief um, is delayed as he inserts the with him who sings to one clear hope in diverse tones between the word truth and the description of what that truth is. He's delaying your arrival of actually coming to what the truth is. Once he does reveal what he believed, he imme immediately throws it into doubt, saying, but who shall so forecast the years and find in loss a gain to match? The expectation uh, or the experience of loss, rather, he feels overwhelms the potential promise of a higher life after death. The next stanza, though, offers an alternative that blends both the faith he held and the doubt he feels. Let love clasp grief left, lest both be drowned. Love and grief together, intertwined without compromising either, is the only way to endure. This reads like a resolution, supported by the fact that at first, the next canto seems to be moving forward onto a different subject, a pretty common experience in reading In Memoriam. But actually, the opening line of Canto 2 appeals back to the first with the word graspist, which can both seem to complement and to undermine the clasp of the previous canto. Indeed, the yew tree's tentacular wrapping around the bones of the buried dead is paradoxically that for which Tennyson longs and something that he recognizes as parasitic. Tennyson feels himself drawn into the longing for the proximity that the tree's gnarled grasping promises, but also feels himself adopting the gloom, sullenness, and stubbornness of the tree. Letting love clasp grief, it seems, is as deadly as it is restorative. So we see in these stanzas a bit of the pattern of how Tennyson works throughout the poem, constantly recursive, constantly calling into question the resolutions arrived at. This is essentially, especially apparent when Tennyson is approaching what is really the actual central theme of the poem, the Odyssey. 
um, which is a fancy word meaning an attempt to understand the goodness of the divine in light of suffering. For while grief is there as a mood that's ever present and animating, what Tennyson is constantly struggling with is how that grief can abide with his sense of divine goodness. This is part of the reason the poem begins not with an address to Hallam, but to Christ, the strong son of God, immortal love, whom we that have not seen thy face by faith and faith alone embrace believing where we cannot prove. These lines are both an appeal to the strength of Christ, but also foreground his absence. Belief and faith are all that Tennyson has, not the assurance of proof that he longs for. The poem is thus a complaint and a challenge to God, asking him to justify his ways to humanity. As you can imagine, though, from what we've already discussed, Tennyson never lets us rest on one easy solution to this problem. Indeed, T.S. Eliot famously said that the poem's, uh, quote, faith is a poor thing, but its doubt is a very intense experience, end quote. Tennyson himself seems to endorse this interpretation in Canto 96, um, where he says, you say, but with no touch of scorn, sweethearted you whose light blue eyes are tender over drowning flies. You tell me doubt is devil born. I know not one indeed I knew in many a subtle question verse who touched a jarring lyre at first, but ever strove to make it true. Perplexed in faith, but pure in deeds. At last he beat his music out. There lives more faith in honest doubt, believe me, than in half the creeds. Um, there's a sort of parallel that he's always drawing, and you can see it here between um, Hallam and uh, David and the Psalms. And so Hallam is David, David is Hallam, and the two sort of bleed together here. And so, however, I think that reading this poem, with all due respect to T.S. Eliot, um, uh, and reading this poem as doubt is overly simplistic um, and ignores the refusal of fixedness um, that's embedded in the movements that Tennyson creates throughout his works. As Canto 96 then continues, we see a picture of Hallam as emblematic of a kind of faith that can live with doubt. He fought his doubts and gathered strength. He would not make his judgments blind. He faced the specters of the mind and laid them. Thus he came at length to, to find a stronger faith his own. And power was with him in the night, which makes the darkness and the light and dwells not in the light alone, but in the darkness and the cloud as over Sinai's peaks of old, while Israel made their gods of gold, although the trumpet blew so loud. Throughout the poem, Tennyson is embracing this paradox of doubt and faith together, dark and light, love and grief, conscious of the danger in such an approach, but forging it as a valid theological stance, a lived theological stance, really. The final appeal here is to the biblical story of Sinai, where Israel, after being freed from enslavement, turns to craft an idol while Moses is away receiving the law and the Ten Commandments. And in it, Tennyson is foregrounding this tradition that he sees of Israel to David to Hallam and now to himself of imperfect faith made perfect through the process of doubt. However, it is not just grief over Hallam's death that is the source of Tennyson's doubt. Tennyson is also ang uh, very anxious about science, um, and it's actually this element, uh, perhaps more than almost anything, that has appealed in this poem to contemporary readers. Um, and it might seem strange, right, um, for this sort of scientific element here. But Tennyson published the poem in 1850, um, about nine years prior to Darwin's On the Origin of Species. However, there were many scientific theorists such as William, William Paley, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, Charles Lyell, who came before Darwin, um, and who sort of paved the way of this sort of revolution that was going to happen in science. Tennyson was familiar with these precursors to Darwin and read in them the troubling implications on Christian doctrine that has so often animated the conversations between science and religion over the past two centuries. However, Tennyson also read in these works challenges to romantic and enlightenment ideals that spoke of the rationality of the cosmos, the beauty and goodness of nature, and the general anthropocentrism, the focus on humanity of the world. And so this thing that seems strange, the science, is actually a very meaningful for him. And the most important of these works to fueling Tennyson's anxiety was Charles Lyell's The Principles of Geology, published between 1830 and 1833. In the work, Lyle explores the layers of the earth, paying attention, per, uh, particular attention to erosion and the fossil record found in those layers. So it seems like pretty dry stuff for Tennyson, the poet, to be reading. Um, 
But Lyle's conclusion in the work is that rather than being formed and changed by sudden events, such as the biblical flood, the geological record revealed the earth to be undergoing a slow, imperceptible, steady process of decay. Tennyson read Lyle in 1837, so in the midst of this period, and understood the implication that while the traditional belief had held by Tennyson and indeed by Hallam, and we actually have some essays that Hallam wrote on this subject, that men rise up on stepping stones of their dead selves to higher things, that line from the very beginning of the poem, um, that the scientific consensus was shifting to suggest that the earth was a colder and unfriendlier place. If the earth itself was slowly dying, there was no guarantee that humanity would survive. And the perfection that Tennyson sees as his hope and the thing that might reunite him with Hallam might never arise if nature is this sort of cold, heartless creature that he's starting to read in the scientific literature. There are so many sections of the poem that deal with science, and I love them all. I think they're fantastic. But I want to draw our attention to one in particular that's a bit lengthy. Um, so again, I'm going to read from it um, at length so that we can see the progression of how Tennyson is treating this doubt um, that nature is causing in him. So I've included there, it's kind of small, but hopefully you can read along with me. Oh, yet we trust that somehow good will be the final goal of ill to pangs of nature, sins of will, defects of doubt and taints of blood, that nothing walks with aimless feet, that not one life shall be destroyed or cast as rubbish to the void, when God hath made the pile complete, that not a worm is cloven in vain, that not a moth with vain desire is shriveled in a fruitless fire or but subserves another's gain. Behold, we know not anything. I can but trust that good shall fall, at last far off, at last to all, and every winter change to spring. So runs my dream, but what am I? An infant crying in the night, an infant crying for the light, and with no language but a cry. The wish that of the living whole no life may fail beyond the grave derives it not from what we have, the likest God within the soul. Our God in nature, then at strife that nature lends such evil dreams, so careful of the type she seems, so careless of the single life, that I, considering everywhere her secret meaning in her deeds, and finding that of fifty seeds she often brings but one to bear, I falter where I firmly trod, and falling with my weight of cares upon the great world's altar stairs, the slope that slope through darkness up to God, I stretch lame hands of faith and grope and gather dust and chaff and call to what I feel is Lord of all and faintly trust the larger hope. So careful of the type, but no, from scarpered cliff and quarried stone, she cries, a thousand types are gone. I care for nothing, all shall go. Thou makest thine appeal to me, I bring to life, I bring to death. The spirit does but mean the breath, I know no more. And he, shall he, man, her last work, who seemed so fair, such splendid purpose in his eyes, who rolled the psalms to wintry skies, who built his fame, him fanes of fruitless prayer, who trusted God was love indeed, and love creation's final law, though nature red in tooth and claw with ravine shrieked against his creed, who loved, who suffered countless ills, who battled for the true, the just, be blown about the desert dust or sealed within the iron hills. No more? A monster than a dream, a discord, dragons of the prime that tear each other in their slime, where mellow music matched with him. O life as futile, then as fail, O for thy voice to soothe and bless, what hope of answer or redress behind the veil, behind the veil. I love the reference to dinosaurs in there, the dragons of the prime as well. Always love a good 19th century dinosaur. Um, <clears throat> But I like this section of the poem and truthfully probably could have done this whole lecture just on this. Um, so I hope you go back and reread it because I only have time to talk about a little bit of it. But the general course that you can see in that section is from the point of a sort of pre-scientific hope where Tennyson has a moral or religious sense that every part of the creation is ordered, that all evil ultimately works for good, that the death of a worm um, is just as significant as an individual human life in the sense that each is planned, that everything is significant. I can but trust that good shall fall at last far off, at last to all, and every winter change to spring. However, the science he has been reading tells him that this is 
something of an infantile view. Um, notice how this realization sort of bridges two of the cantos. At first, Tennyson believes that nature cares for the human species, even if not the individual life, so careful of the type she seems, so careless of the single life, the type being the species. But as the section continues, he loses faith in even that, so careful of the type, but no. Lyle and the others have shown that nature is indifferent to the species and that the fair and splendid purpose of humanity is merely another part of the natural discord and animosity, the brutality that is the true marker of progress. So Tennyson is overwhelmed by the sense of sort of arbitrariness of the natural world. Yet even in the depths of this despair, Tennyson finds a glimmer of hope behind the veil, behind the veil. Um, and anytime there's a repetition like that in poetry, you want to pay attention. A reference here is to both the veil of death that Hallam is behind and to um, the biblical temple, um, the veil that for ancient Israel hid um, the Ark of the Covenant and the presence of God, where the presence of God rested. In both cases, the absence and the hiddenness of God and Hallam prevents the hope from being fixed, a fixed comfort. Um, but they allow Tennyson to maintain his faith amid the doubts raised by scientific developments. And in fact, science ceases to be an obstacle to faith, but its complement, as throughout the poem Tennyson builds on the scientific context, an idea of something like spiritual evolution. So the final sections I want to read to you tonight are to me the most beautiful and I think poignant parts of the poem, as well as being fit for us um, to be reading just before December. If there's any sense of narrative progression in the poem in the midst of all of this sort of like careening and going back and forth, it's that throughout the poem, Tennyson structures it around three successive Christmases, um, each year sort of marking a new Christmas that's appearing and you see the mark of three years going by. To anyone familiar with the theological significance of Christmas, it will no doubt stand out to you that Tennyson is turning to the incarnation, this Christian doctrine of divine revelation in the person of Christ, um, as something of an antidote to the problem of hiddenness that we've been talking about. So this idea of God becoming human being a sort of ultimate expression of the possibility that revelation is real. However, as we might expect, expect by now, the Christmases are dynamic parts of the poem, resisting our straightforward plotting of them. The first, for instance, uh, occurs from Cantos 28 to 30 and provides us with probably the most uh, straightforward progression from grief to hope, um, though in truth, most of it is actually quite depressing. Um, so here Tennyson starts the section by setting the stage with the time draws near the birth of Christ, the moon is hid, the night is still, the Christmas bells from hill to hill answer each other in the mist. And as Christmas approaches, Tennyson and his friends and his family feel a difficulty in celebrating. They say with trembling fingers did we weave the holly round the Christmas hearth, a rainy cloud possessed the earth, and sadly fell our Christmas Eve. At our old pastimes in the hall we gambled making vain pretense of gladness with an awful sense of one mute shadow watching all Hallam, the shadow watching everything. We paused, the winds were in the beach, we heard them sweep the winter land, and in a circle hand in hand sat silent looking each at each. Celebration seems impossible in this context because of Hallam's absence, but almost spontaneously that celebration emerges. Then echo like our voices rang, we sung, though every eye was dim, a merry song we sang with him, last year impetuously we sang. We ceased, a gentler feeling crept upon us, surely rest is meet. They rest, we said, their sleep is sweet, and silence followed, and we wept. Our voices took a higher range, once more we sang, they do not die, nor lose their mortal sympathy, nor change to us, although they change. Wrapped from the fickle and the frail, with gathered power yet the same, pierces the keen seraphic flame, from orb to orb, from veil to veil, veils again here. Rise, happy morn, rise, holy morn. Draw forth the cheerful day from night. O Father, touch the east and light, the light that shone when hope was born. Hope is in the next section, is born in this section out of grief. Um, but as the years go, year goes by, and as the poem continues out of the Christmas section, grief returns. In the next Christmas in Canto 78, the pain of loss is so severe that it's almost numbing. So this one's shorter. Again, at Christmas, did we weave the holly round the Christmas hearth? The silent snow possessed the earth and calmly fell our Christmas Eve. 
The Yule clog sparkled clean, keen with frost, no wing of wind the region swept, but over all things brooding slept the quiet sense of something lost. As in the winters left behind, again our ancient games had place, the mimic pictures breathing grace and dance and song and hooded blind, and hoodman blind, who showed a token of distress, no single tear, no mark of pain. O sorrow, then can sorrow wane? O grief, can grief be changed to less? O last regret, regret can die. No, mixed with all this mystic frame, her deep relations are the same, but with long use her tears are dry. Note the return to some of the same patterns of the previous Christmas, but this time, rather than spontaneously resolving in hope, they lead to a numb, almost tearless despair, a grief so deep that it no longer has any space for physical or poetic expression. The final Christmas, though, from Cantos 104 to 106, is in many ways the climax of the whole poem of In Memoriam. In this section, Tennyson expresses his fulfillment of, or his fullest pronouncement of hope in a potential resolution. But in making that hope a pronouncement, it opens up to the it it opens it up to the possibility that it might not ultimately come to pass. The sections begin with the same lines as that first Christmas. The time draws near the birth of Christ. The moon is hid. The night is still. But this time, rather than a series of churches responding, the bells sort of echoing back to each other, a single church below the hill is peeling folded in the mist, a single peal of bells below that wakens at this hour of rest, a single murmur in the breast, that these are not the bells I know. Like strangers' voices, here they sound in lands where not a memory strays, nor landmark breeze of other days. Sorry, weird thing on my computer. Um but all is new on hallowed ground. The whole Christmas has a much quieter, darker, expectant tone. And one of the main reasons is that it's not actually Christmas yet. It's Christmas Eve. The actual feast and celebration have yet to arrive. Instead, we sit in the silence in the dark of a cold winter night, waiting for this incarnation, waiting on revelation to appear at its fullest form. And the sense is kind of depressing in this stanza. Tonight, ungathered, let us leave this laurel, let this holly stand. We live within the stranger's land and strangely falls our Christmas Eve. Our father's dust is left alone and silent under other snows. There in due time, the wood woodbine blows, the violet comes, but we are gone. No more shall wayward grief abuse, the genial hour with mask and mime. For change of place, the growth of time has broke the bond of dying use. Let cares that petty shadows cast, but which our lives are chiefly proved. A little space the night I loved, and hold it solemn to the past. But let no footstep beat the floor, nor bowl of wassail mantle warm, for who would keep an ancient form, through which the spirit breathes no more? Be neither song, nor game, nor feast, nor harp be touched, nor flute be blown, no dance, no motion, save alone what lightens in the lucid east, of rising worlds by yonder wood, Long sleeps the summer in the seed. Run out your measured arcs and lead the closing sight goal, rich and good. And then the next canto comes. Ring out, wild bells, to the wild sky, the flying cloud, the frosty light. The year is dying in the night. Ring out, wild bells, and let him die. Ring out the old, ring in the new. Ring, happy bells, across the snow. The year is going, let him go. Ring out the false, ring in the true. Christmas has arrived. Yay. The morning has broken and with it out goes the old and in comes the new. Tennyson provides us with this whole magnificent canto after the darkness where we're called into doubt of even celebrating the sort of who would keep these ancient forms. Um, and in its place, we're left with this canto that is super abundant with repetition and bursting with the newness that's going to emerge. Again, we might do a whole lecture on this um, and on what Tennyson is seeing in this moment, but part of the point here is that it's just too much to get into a single read, even if you're reading it yourself. Um, so rather than try, I'm gonna just read the whole rest of this canto. Ring out wild bells to the wild sky, the flying cloud, the frosty light, the year is dying in the night. Ring out wild bells and let him die. Ring out the old, ring in the new. Ring happy bells across the snow, the year is going, let him go. Ring out the false, ring in the true. Ring out the grief that saps the mind for those that here we see no more. Ring out the feud of rich and poor, ring in redress to all mankind. Ring out a slowly dying cause and ancient forms of party strife. Ring in the noble 
gentler modes of life with sweeter manners, purer laws. Ring out the want, the care, the sin, the faithless coldness of the times. Ring out, ring out my mournful rhymes, but ring the fuller minstrel in. Ring out false pride in, pl in place and blood, the civic slander and the spite. Ring in the love of truth and right, ring in the common love of good. Ring out old shapes of foul disease, ring out the narrowing lust of gold, ring out the thousand wars of old, ring in the thousand years of peace, ring in the valiant man and free, the heart, larger heart, the kindlier hand, ring out the darkness of the land, ring in the Christ that is to be. <clears throat> so this has all been a lot to hit you with on a Monday night. Um, and I'm aware that I haven't even gotten to the most famous lines of the poem, the tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved and all. And I haven't told you how it ends. Um, and part of the reason for this is that as I've stressed throughout reading these sections tonight, the rhythm that Tennyson builds for us throughout the poem is in many ways more important than any single moment or destination. I love the ending of this poem, but I think that if we ignore all that I've just walked with you through, this constant oscillation between sorrow and acceptance, doubt, faith. And if we read too quickly to arrive at that resolution, we can miss how even that, even that resolution um, is more complicated than we might expect. Even the moment that I just read to you, this moment bursting with exuberance, with joy, with triumph, um, you can note how Tennyson phrases the stanza as this unrealized command, ring in or we could say, you ring in, you, the reader, ring this in. We remain in between the thousand wars of old and the thousand years of peace, and the Christ that is to be has yet to appear. Indeed, there's so much grief in the 20 or so cantos that come after this section. Um, and yet, the one clear moment of hope helps to color and change the tenor of that grief in some small way. So then, in closing, where does this leave us? I titled this talk Grieving with Tennyson. Um, so I do want to talk a bit about what this poem did for its original audience and what it can do for us. As I said at the beginning, um, for the Victorians, In Memoriam was the poem. The Victorianist scholar um, Eric Gray, who's Norton Critical Edition, um, I've been using and would recommend has theorized that one of the reasons for this is that the Victorians were obsessed with rituals of mourning and of death. Most of us can think of examples from the period, um, you know, things like the moment in Oliver Twist of Oliver being employed as a mourning boy at a funeral, or you might think about like memento moris, um, these things of like a lock of hair or a death mask made to remember somebody who's died, or even the large ornate Victorian tombs that cover both the US and Britain. However, what I really want to emphasize here is the ritual element of In Memoriam. As we have seen, what In Memoriam does so masterfully is rehearse for us over and over and over and over again the feeling of what it means to experience loss, both its intense pain and the inexplicable peace and joy in that things like the memory of the departed can conjure up. Think again of Queen Victoria's insistence that next to the Bible, In Memoriam has been her comfort. I don't think that this comfort for her was because of resolution. Um, but because of the poem's frank dealing with the realities of human experience. In the poem, Tennyson manages something extremely difficult for a poet, which is to take the particular, make it magnificently universal, but to do that through its particularity. Nothing is more personal than grief. As no two experiences of grief are ever the same, grief depends on the particularity of the one lost and the one who lost them. If Emily Tennyson were to write this poem, it would have been different than her brother's. And yet grief is also universal. We can each see in Tennyson's grief glimpses of our own, but that grief over a lost loved one, grief over something bigger than that, grief over the current climate crisis or over wars or over poverty, over a thousand other tragedies that we see today are glimpsed in this moment of Tennyson's grief. This invitation then is one of the reasons that the poem inspired so many copycats. Famous and unknown poets throughout the century and a half since it was published have turned to its stanza structure and form to create their own versions of dealing with their own grief. Which really points me to my final thought. If Tennyson's poem matters uh, because it is a ritual of grief, then its form, stanzas, rhythm, and style matter for the way they embody that ritual. 
So when you read the poem, and I hope that you have been convinced or inspired tonight to do so, I encourage you to let that style wash over you. Read it out loud to yourself or to a friend or to a family member, listen to an audio recording of it, or just meditate on it silently. In the process of reading it, the sound structure of the meter, rhyme, and style create a place in which we can abide. They're linguistic acts that don't just depict something, but create a space for universal and particular grief. The words matter, and it's through them that both we and Tennyson perhaps are able to be healed. Thank you. <laughs>